Hi, Gislin. So happy to have you on this podcast to discuss one of the most iconic houses in the world, Bulgari. How are you? I'm very good. Hi, Sonia. It's very nice for inviting me in this podcast. I'm very happy to discuss the whole wonderful world of Bulgari with you. So happy to be there. Thank you for the invitation. So first, tell us, what is your job? What are you doing at Bulgari? I think a lot of people will be very inspired, a bit jealous. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us, what, what is this new role of yours at Bulgari? I'm the Heritage Curator Director. So in these words, the idea is to be handling the whole archive of Bulgari, which is all that would say the paper archives, all the documentation that we have. Also the Bulgari Heritage Collection, which are the jewels, but also some of the watches and objects produced, I would say, from the past, which are now historic elements recording all the periods, all the decades, case in which Bulgari has produced some of the elements and which are, I would say, fragments of history from which we can build the exhibitions, which could be, I would say, the third pillar in which I'm working in, which is really the development of how talking about the history of the Maison, the style, the artistic inspirations, uh, thanks to exhibitions and other projects. So in this education, I would say we have to train all the teams, the newcomers, but also the old one, to rediscover the world of Bulgari. We analyze some of the elements we have found thanks to the research because we're updating the research, but also out of it, communicating to all the people who are interested within the exhibitions as talking on the heritage, which is something I really love sharing about this wonderful world of the history of the Maison. That sounds great. I'm really excited about your job, actually. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. And Gisela, you talked about always improving the research. Is there also like improving the collection itself, like the heritage pieces? Is it also looking for pieces that might have been sold to bring them back into the collection of Bulgaria so people can learn from them? It absolutely is, yes. What we do is that both from the archives, we're studying what we have in terms of designs, in terms of documentations, to know more of the elements, but it's also enriching, I would say, the collection itself. We have about a thousand pieces in the collection at the moment from the very early silver objects produced by the founder of the Maison, Sotirio Bulgari, and all the workshops of the time. But also we're trying to enrich and augment some of the elements we have in the collection by looking for some of the elements that will be missing, some of the pieces that would come, I would say, by chance, because we have people from private collections coming to us, things coming to auctions, things that would happen to arrive by chance by many other means. And the idea is really, yes, to augment the collection, to make it bigger, not to be too big, but to really have a consistent presentation of the history of the Maison, like a collection would do, and to really explain in the best way all the great moments in terms of history and how the Maison grew up in time with its own personal style. Which brings us nicely to what is the history of the house. I mean, this podcast is called Jury Connoisseur. It's Bulgari, assuming most people know. But let's go back to the roots. You're talking about the founders and the silverware. So can we go back a bit? How did Bulgari start and how did they evolve into the brand that we know today? Everything started with one man whose Italianized name is Sotirio Bulgari. But initially he had an S in the end. It's Sotirios Bulgaris. He was from Greece, from a pirate, so we are in the northwest of Greece. He was a silversmith. He was a goldsmith. He was a craftsman working with the precious metals in this part of the world. It was probably a family tradition in this part, in the city of Paramitia, which is an important city in this part of Greece, which has a historic tradition of working, which means engraving, chasing, hammering the metal in a large way, silver mostly. And we are in the middle of the 19th century because he was born in 1857. So in this period, the context was not easy. Greece was uh, trying to get their independence, which they obtained lately, but it was against the Ottoman Empire. So things were quite difficult, I would say, in terms of the context. And the family had to move and to leave Paramitia, their land historically, which was quite difficult at some point. And they moved to Corfu initially. And young Sotirio, who was a 20-year-old young man, skilled craftsman, I would say, decided to move on his own with another great skilled person. And they said probably their future was in somewhere else. So they left uh, the Greek world, I would say, and decided to come to Italy because they thought it would be the place to be in terms of market, of production and recognition 
of their skills. They started with Naples, and we were in the early 1880s. The um, Italian country was unified pretty much recently at the time. Naples left some of it historic, I would say, monarchy with a court, with an elegant aristocracy and great clients who would love beautiful things at some point. And he thought it would be a good place, and he was right, to set up at the time such a business. However, unfortunately for him, he got robbed and he lost pretty much everything. But I would say what is really good is that with pretty much nothing in the pocket, he said, let's give it a new try and let's change the city. And he moved to Rome because he understood that this city, who would be the new capital of this new unified country, but also the historic capital for the Grand Tour, the people traveling all over Europe, discovering the beauties of Italy, people coming for some pilgrimage also to the Vatican, people discovering and making their education for the nobility coming to the historic sites of ancient Rome. He thought this could be the place to be. Coming from the world, I would say the Greek world, Greek or Roman, he had a perfect understanding of the historic elements within the city. And he decided to establish near the Spanish steppes. So we're going to be in the very hot spots, I would say that today are attracting millions of visitors per year. But I would say he understood this place was the important area in which the people interested in these craftsmanships could come. And he was at the top of the Spanish steppes on the Asistina when he opened his first boutique in 1884. And he would move 10 years later down the steps on the Acondotti, which is still today the area with the historic address where we are today. And he would really understand that this area would be the area of passage of some of the people coming to the great places, the great sites of Rome, coming to the Vatican. The air was really the center, I would say, of the high tourism of the time. And he perfectly understood that the people that would come would be interested in not only the great Roman nobility, because you had great families with great tastes, beautiful palazzi, the great palaces, but also having some of the foreigners who would come to enjoy the pleasure of being in Rome. And the first boutique, what we have in the archives, we have photos of the historic boutiques, and we have some of the documents when you can see written in French, bijoux, curiosités, so curiosities, jewels, to really understand that some of the I would say the people traveling at the time would probably speak French, which was one of the key languages for culture at the time. And then he changed the boutique. And after the novels of Charles Dickens, he called it the old curiosity shop in English this time. So I think it's interesting also to see how a man, an entrepreneur, we would say today, almost alone with some people of the family, some people of the Greek community, settle a business in a new city, his new adopted land that would be the Roman area. And he understood who would be the great clients who would be interested in art objects, because not only silverware was produced, but also precious objects in silver, some jewels, some rare objects. He also developed a business of antique dealing objects. I would say large at some point, but really understanding who would be the people coming there and step by step becoming important. And this is why he said, if my name was of Greek origins, I should Italianize it. So he took off the final letter and we can see written S point Bulgari without the S in the end, to be Italianized and more accepted and more really connected to the city he decided to belong. And what a name. I mean, we all know the famous quip from Richard Burton saying that Elizabeth Taylor, only word in Italian that she knew was Bulgari. <laughs> exactly. That was a, a quick quote, but very efficient, very strong, very powerful. Some of the great figures would love the name and would adopt also some of the jewels. Our founder, Sotirio never met Liz Taylor, I would say. Unfortunately, he died. He passed away in 1932. And he passed on all the skills, understanding, knowledge, and passion to his sons. In large family, but two of the sons really decided to continue the business. Costantino and Giorgio, I would say, had very complementary skills, but very different kind of interests they developed for the business. The 
silver side and the antique dealer aspect would be really the side of the first of the two brothers, the big brother, Costantino, who was the scholar or the intellectual research on precious silverware, historic silverware, not only silver produced by the workshop, but also silver in time, in history, because they had some precious historic vintage silver, we would say, or antique silver today. And these elements were very important, as important as Costantino wrote a complete book on Italian silversmith. So as a true scholar, he was a writer, and he really, really understood the interest of the history of his own profession and the one of his father, and also developed an area within the store with precious artifacts. There were some precious jades, for example, from Asia, which was part of the elements that the Maison would also sell at some point. Really understanding these elements and really having some of the great clients uh, trying to find rare artifacts. The other brother, Giorgio, received a mission from Sotirio, who really understood something was going on in what today we call high jewelry. And he said, you have to go to Paris, you have to go to France, you have to see what's going on in Place Vendôme, the place to go, and come back, just give us some feedback of what you will discover there. And Giorgio went there, and he came back to his brother, to his father, and said, there really is something in terms of fine jewelry. We should develop more in terms of what the French are doing, but let's do it in our way. So the evolution of it in the early Belle Epoque style, we would say, because he was there about 1905 to 1908 with different journeys. And what we know is that at this moment, the 1910s was the Belle Epoque style, the garland style, as we said, some of the white style, so many names to qualify what platinum was winning in terms of production. So diamonds, pearls, fine pearls. And, of course, on the white metal, they developed this with different workshops, workshops that will be in Paris, workshops that would be in Italy, to really, I would say, create their own style. And in the 20s, also some journeys made them coming to the exhibition of Art Deco in particular. And they decided, OK, Art Deco should be the international style of the time, but let's do it in our way. And this is something, when you look at some of the elements you can see some of the pieces really inspired by the international Art Deco flavor. However, whenever you look at some of the Parisian objects, and being French, I know them having been worked in, in, this, in this business before, you have a tradition in Art Deco, in particularly in the 20s, of more flat objects. It's not a critic. It's just something you can recognize in many of the brooches, in many of the bracelets and other objects. They're more flattened with an enhancing of the colors, of the motifs, of the designs. We really see a Bulgari touch within the creation of Art Deco with a sense of volume, which already is important, is going to be a key signature in the end. But it's their own way to adapt what they sow to their own interest and their own flavor. And this is something I find very interesting because they did these long sautoir transformable elements with platinum and diamonds in the 1920s and mostly in the 30s. But they did it with a sense of movement, a sense of a large volume at this period, which was really, really something they tried to focus on, I would say. And things would be on this style until the Second World War. With the Second World War, like in many other countries in Europe, platinum would be used for weapon uses, for military uses at some points. So platinum was no longer something that would be used, and gold would be more in favor. It's something like a safe choice in the world at some point. And we see this in many crisis moments in history. But not only was it a choice of uh, lack of material and obligation for the context, it's the color of the sun, it's a shiny color with yellow gold used in particular. And if after the Second World War, many of the Parisian or London or American maisons of jewelry would return to a platinum for, for evening and yellow gold for daytime, Bulgari understood that the use of yellow gold could be something very powerful, very strong, and could be something of a signature, in fact, of the brand. And they decided to stick with yellow gold 
and to use it as their favorite metal. And this is late 40s, early 50s, and mostly in the 60s, the great development of the style. So if I have to consider there is a shift in terms of history, I would say until the Second World War, we could call it the period of the origins, the period of the development of the style, the period where Bulgari was settling their own creations. From the middle of the 20th century, we really consider this is the great moment in which they will produce, uh, at the time, these two brothers without their father, will really understand how to create uh, something of their own in this great atmosphere of what sometimes it's called the Italian boom, the Italian miracle, the made in Italy development. I mean, there are so many names to say many great maisons of fashion, of accessories, of furniture design. I mean, you can look at how Italy developed amazing things at the time. It doesn't mean they didn't do something before. It's just at the time was crystallized something that in so many art and design aspects, you had a great development and you had a great idea of let's do something differently. And I would say that the Italian school of jewelry, as some historian call it, was really driven by the Bulgari touch and this idea of more color, the use of yellow gold, different volumes, all these aspects would really, really become important since the late 40s and up to the 60s become something of their major interest. And it will be the moment in which people like Elizabeth Taylor, as you said, some of the glorious figures would become important for the name of the Maison. It's also the great years of Cinecitta and uh, the cinema in Italy and all the uh, the glamorous stars who wear Bulgari when they go to Cannes, to the festival. There's a whole... Uh, mystique around it. So thank you so much for giving us this timeline, Gislan. And I have one question. When is Bulgari becoming so famous for its use of massive color gemstones and extraordinary color gemstones? Because you mentioned the gold, but I think for most of us, when we think of a Bulgari piece, we think of really extraordinary color gemstones. Diamonds, but the gemstone seems to be even more important somehow. When does that start? Perfect transition in terms of timing, I would say. It really starts in this exact way. After the Second World War, they were building their own style. If we had to, let's say, kind of make a summary of this revolution in terms of style. Being educated as an art historian, I'm kind of studying the Maison's identity, like we would do with a painter, a sculptor, in terms of the evolution. And I would say there are three key words to qualify this evolution of a style at the moment, which means late 40s to the 60s, which is this great moment of over two decades in which you build such a style. I would say the first is color, and that would be important with the gemstones. The second key word would be the volume. And I think this is important to have a better understanding of how they played with these volumes and created some specific shapes. And the third key word would be the proportions, and they will really create something of their own. So let's start with the color to answer your question, because it really is something that everyone, as you perfectly said, associate the Bulgari style with these great gemstones, this mix of colored gemstones. What they realized is that at the time, most of the high jewelry tradition, we would call it this way, was driven by what the French craftsmanship was leading, which was a Place Vendôme oriented kind of diamond plus one gemstone production of jewelry. Sometimes you had a second color. But the idea was to some sort of less is more kind of uh, approach, uh, which was done at the time, which matched, I would say, with the requirements probably of the French society and the international society. However, they really understood that maybe some other combination could be used, something that was not really done before or rarely, I would say. And they tried to systematize this idea, to generalize it with mixing different colors. And it implies using the big four, as we call it today, diamonds, rubies, sapphires, and emeralds. But also it implied not considering the gemstones only for their intrinsic, which means economical value, but considering them for their color property. And today, 
I mean, in gemological laws, I would say, since the 2000s, we all talk about gemstones in large way because we know that this term of precious, semi-precious, and other things, they do not correspond to something specific. However, you imagine this 50, 60 years ago, it, it was not something in the air. The idea that the use of uh, the precious stones could be matching with something different was very daring. It was quite innovative at the time. And uh, they would use, uh, I would say these words, not because it's my opinion, because at the time it was the way it was called. They used semi-precious or ornamental stones, which means the translucent stones like the amethyst, like the citrines, like the topaz, or the ornamental like lapis, turquoise, uh, onyx, and they would just combine them like, I always say that because I feel it this way, like a painter would play with the pigments on a palette, producing a painting. And I think the chromatic effect in the end was the purpose. And if they thought this blue would match with this purple and this green, let's just put them together without consideration of was it be considered formally as precious or not? And it would really, really add layers of uh, colors and so impact to the pieces to create their own style. What is also helping a lot is the understanding of how light played with gemstones. Most of the historic stones, I would say, since the 17th century, I would say in history, is the idea of faceting, because faceting is introducing light. I mean, we'll, we all know this when we study gemology, light is coming inside and outside, reflection, refraction, light is playing with the gemstones, and faceting is helping a lot to that. However, if you polish the surface in a round way and you lead to cabochon cut, you are focusing your interest not on the light effect, but more on how deep is the color in it. So the stronger the color, I would say, the more interesting it became for the Bulgari style at the time. And the cabochon became step by step a signature of the maison. And this is something super interesting to understand because the cabochon cut is a historic cut, I would say since antiquity. And being in Rome, which is, with the Roman Empire, a historic place for antiquity, it's also a beautiful collection in terms of art history you can find. And even if it has been used rarely in the past centuries, or used mostly for these so-called non-precious stones, it was kind of unthinkable to have them for the precious. And adding rubies with cabochon cut or sapphires or emeralds all put together combining them with a strong dense color impact was really really revealing a new style and this is i would say the first key characteristic bulgari was daring at the time it was really just betting on the color impact and creating something which would definitely become their own identity. And it worked because you can recognize it very strongly in the 60s that the French magazine Connaissance des Arts said a quote that I really adore. They said that it was easy to recognize and identify a Bulgari jewel as easy as a Chanel suit. So you really have this idea that if something was recognizable in fashion like the Chanel kind of outfit, you can do the same with the Bulgari design because the design was so easily recognizable, you couldn't have any doubt of such look. The second key thing to understand it is this idea of volume. And I was talking about the cabochon. I mean, it's a round volume. A cabochon is flat at the bottom, but then it's like a dome of the church's of Rome. That's also a way we see it. I mean, living in Rome recently for this role that I'm taking, I'm in love with this landscape of Rome. And I can really understand from the hills of Rome to the domes and cupolas of the churches, you really have such an inspiring architecture in front of you, whether it's a natural architecture or something built by mankind in centuries of history. And this is also something you can link to the cabochon cut. These volumes were, some people wrote also, they were kind of compact volume. Instead of having them 
dispersed. They just combine some of the elements to create something which would create not a flat surface, as I said formerly, but something that would be more rounded, more curved, more dynamic also, to create something which would be part of their own style. And the treatment of the volume is a sense, is an understanding of how making something differently also with oval shapes, circular shapes, geometry in a large way. The volume was very geometrical. And I think that's a key element in the construction of the jewel to have an understanding of the Bulgari style. And the last thing is proportion. And I think that's a sentiment, that's a feeling I always had when I look at the Bulgari piece at some point, is that if you put very bold colors and you put a very hard volume without any sense of proportion, it could become over the top. And this is the key to the success of a good design to me. It is that the measurement of the right proportions is perfectly understood by the Bulgari family and their designers back in the time and keep done today to create what is the Bulgari identity or DNA, as we call it. It is, for example, the sense of symmetry. When you look at these jewels, compared to, for example, the French jewelry, which plays a lot with asymmetry to create some volumes and movements in a different way. The sense of symmetry, a certain rigor, I would say, a certain way of playing with the proportions was very, very important to the construction of the jewel. I'm using a lot of the word construction, but I think that the comparison with the word of architecture is very interesting to understand also a Bulgari jewel. To me, an architect can have a good sense of proportion also. We have to remain that Italy is also the country of the ideal proportions of the golden number. So th these rules of proportions in sculpture, in painting, in architecture that was made, I mean, we all have the Leonardo da Vinci design for the proportions, but I'm also thinking of the sculptures from Greece and Rome, of how the proportions of the body could create a perfect measurement. Well, perfect is a big word, but it was the canon of beauty at the time. And it's like Greece, Italy and Greece invented the classical beauty, as we call it. And knowing that the family was coming from Greece, the sense of classical beauty in terms of understanding of the proportion it is perfectly embodied with the way that they play with it. And this is how some strong and daring colors put together with a lovely volume would never be a failure because everything is perfectly structured, organized in terms of proportion. And this is probably why in the second half of the 50s and all the 60s, it was the key moment in which all the stars coming to Rome because of the cinema industry. And you were mentioning Cinecitta, and you're absolutely right. Cinecitta is a creation of a spot that would become a key place for cinema because you would have a cheaper place for filming, cheaper than Hollywood, I would say. So all the Hollywood stars, film directors will go there. You have a wonderful weather, and this I can witness for sure. You have the ability to create decor for the movies in a huge surface because in the south of Rome, you have great space. You can rebuild, I mean, the entire Roman area the way you want, but you can also use the perfect scenery of the actual Roman city. I mean, we have in mind Roman holidays, for example, with Audrey Hepburn on the Vespa, just crossing all the city of Rome and enjoying all the best places that everyone would like to see today. It's thanks to the cinema industry. We all have in mind the image of La Dolce Vita with Fontana di Trevi, all these places that would become key places. And we have in mind Elizabeth Taylor playing the last queen of Egypt, Cleopatra, and everything in Rome. And in a way, to circle back to what you were saying, it was also the occasion for her to discover Bulgari. And this is what she said also, not only Richard Burston said that the only word she knew in Italian was Bulgari, it also what she said that the great advantage to be filming Cleopatra in Rome was Bulgari because she really fell in love with them, with the Maison aesthetics, and she really wore our jewels in a great way.
I know she was a big fan of the Serpenti, and we see her very often wearing a beautiful Serpenti bracelet. And I think there's even a picture of her maybe around her waist as well with the Serpenti. I mean, magnificent. Gislaine has been so fascinating, and you've told us so much about Bulgaria. And I think, like, I've learned so much. I'm sure our listeners will have as well. But tell me, where can we, let's say, if we want to see the pieces, is there a way for us to see them, to learn about them directly? Is there any exhibition happening at the moment that you would like to tell us about? We fortunately have developed in the historic boutique on the Acondotti, number 10, which is the historic boutique in which both Sotirio, his sons, and then grandsons developed the Maison as we know it today. And as I said, historically, there was a room for the precious silver. When you get into the boutique, first on your left, you cannot miss it, you have a double room, which is like a gallery, with historic furniture. The sons of our founder, Sotirio, Costantino and Giorgio, decided in 1934, so two years after the death of their father, to transform the boutique, the shop, and to modernize it. So the facade we have today with Bulgari written is the historic facade of 1934. And they made some beautiful, I would say, display for silver, precious objects, and jewelry on the different rooms. On the left, when you enter, you have what used to be the display for silver. And we have transformed it into what we will call it a heritage gallery. So it's a place which is a non-commercial area. It's not for sale. It's all dedicated to the history, to the heritage of Bulgari. We call it domus. Domus in Latin, you know, it means house and home. So home is important because it's the historic area dedicated to the family, dedicated to the archive, dedicated to the history. And it's the house of heritage. We can call it this way also, which is for us a very important place because it's a place open to everyone. You have a very specific place dedicated to the history of the brand to understand the DNA, the style, how the Maison developed its identity. And what we do is like sort of Museum of Bulgari, I would say, we create exhibitions and we rotate them. We don't have a permanent display, but we have temporary exhibitions three times a year. So you have three different thematics that we're trying to develop and launch. And the very new one we have developed for 2024 until mid-May is precisely on Cabochon. You've understood my love for this, for this cut. I really wanted to dedicate an exhibition to this particular cut. I have been very lucky because we have a heritage team, which is wonderful, with people who have been working for the Maison for years, for decades, really giving their own witness and knowledge to build this exhibition. It's a teamwork. We have people helping us for the exhibition design who have really recreated an entire space, which is really a museum space. And this is what the people working in the boutique said at the opening. They said, you feel like in a museum and we love it. And that was for me the best thing you can say, because being someone educated from the world of museum, I really I wanted to bring something like that. So great teamwork in which we tell the story of how from the early volumes to the first uses of Cabochon, you understand the evolution of it. And not only you go to the 60s, which crystallized the style, but you also have beautiful elements from the 70s, 80s, and 90s, in which Bulgari had a great maturity in terms of style, played with the volumes, developed new elements. And we go to the early 2000s, because this is where it stops the heritage history. And so you can have an evolution, which is, you can look at it in the chronological way, but you can also look at it in the thematical way, because you see how the inspiration can come from other cultures, how the inspiration could have a variety of shapes within the cabochon idea. You have one showcase, which I call Cabochon is Fun, because you really see how you can make little fishes, you can have candy-like elements with cabochon. And one thing not to miss, just it's one of my favorite, but I just want to share. We have in this exhibition, the long sautoir and the ring given by Richard Burton to Elizabeth Taylor with a sugarloaf sapphire for each of them. And they really embody this sense of volume and this interest of color. And they really are more or less at the center of this exhibition. 
among many other beautiful things to discover. So it's something not to miss if you pass by Rome. Well, we're going to close this podcast and I'm going to book a flight to Rome. I think that's why after listening to you talking about the beauties of the city, the Thank you. beautiful exhibition at Bulgaria at the moment and just the light, everything about it makes me feel like wanting to learn more about it and see it in person. So if you're in Rome until mid-May, don't miss it and explore the world of Cabocho through the ages. Thank you so much, Islan. It's been such a pleasure. Really, really enjoyed our conversation. Thanks for sharing so much with us. And looking forward to seeing what you do next in your role at Bulgari. With great pleasure. You're always welcome. Thank you so much.